Okay, I want to make a few comments generally about the exotic pet situation in Canada. Like I said, we've been involved now in our organization for the last th almost 35 years uh, working on these issues and uh, we've seen them in every way, shape or form in every part of the country. If you go back a little while, 20 or 25 years, possibly even a little bit more recently, you'll find that the exotic pet issue was very different than it is today because in the past, if any one of us or any group of us went out 20 years ago, uh, we could, in the space of about three hours, buy a tiger, a lion, a zebra, uh, all kinds of animals that you would see in a typical zoo setting. You could go out in, in Ontario and in other parts of Canada and just buy them. And back then, you could get tigers for as little as about, a, uh, about $100, a monkey for $100, uh, a zebra for the same, so the animals were very available and very cheap. And whenever you walked into uh, any type of situation, whether it's a policymaker's office or a municipal discussion or anything else, the, the whole uh, thrust of, of the conversation was around these animals, sort of the, the primates, the, the tigers and other big cats, bears, the more charismatic animals that you would see in a zoo. Well. The days of walking into any type of situation like that and having these guys being the center of the discussion are pretty much over. Nobody that we encounter anymore in Canada thinks that Joe Smith down the street should really have a tiger in his backyard or that somebody in downtown Toronto should have a cougar in their basement. And by the way, I mention that because I once was a Humane Society inspector and went to a house in downtown Toronto and the guy had seven cougars in his basement. So those days, those days are, are pretty much gone, and the whole conversation has shifted now. And I'm not saying that we still don't find the primates and tigers and other animals out there. We do, and, they, and in Ontario specifically, we don't have any real re, re, uh, regulations covering these animals, so anybody can keep them. But their numbers are very depressed compared to what they were previously, and now a lot of the discussion has shifted to other kinds of animals. So instead of saying, should Joe Smith have the tiger in his backyard or the guy down the street have cougars in his basement, the discussion now is, should we allow hedgehogs in a community? What are the zoonosis risks associated with hedgehogs? Should we have tegu lizards? Should we have snapping turtles? Uh, should we have the big blue parrots? Should we have uh, the small mammalian exotics, uh, and by small I mean not necessarily super small, you know, I'm talking about capybaras and wallabies and kangaroos, animals that were a bit smaller uh, and less dangerous than the ones that used to be so common in the past. So when you go into a policymaker's office and you're discussing a, a provincial law or you're discussing a municipal bylaw, a lot of the conversation now centers around these kinds of animals and of course, the uh, reptiles, amphibians, fish and invertebrates are included in that mix as well. Now, where do you find these animals today? Well, there's lots of places. Obviously, everybody knows you can go to a zoo or aquarium and see these animals. Most of the zoos and aquariums aren't a huge problem with regard to the exotic pet trade. Some still are. The days where you could walk into uh, a zoo in Ontario and buy a wolf that you saw in a cage, they're pretty much gone, but some of the zoos still do supply the the pet trade, we certainly have private menageries that are part of the problem. We have uh, native wildlife displays often run by government agencies or other types of uh, organizations. Um, they're not so much of a problem. We've got sanctuaries that try to offer a solution for at least some animals uh, that are discarded, unwanted, seized by official agencies, etc. Uh, and we've got alternative livestock operations where some animals that traditionally were considered wild or exotic are now considered to be regular uh, uh, facets of uh, agricultural operations. And you've got animals like fallow deer and bison and those creatures that a lot of people, uh, when they look at them legislatively now, just consider them uh, almost as exotic or as domestic animals. Uh, we also have this emerging phenomenon. We've created the term MLAP, Mobile Live Animal Programs. And it's something that really came with the internet age. It's really come into uh, play more in the last 10 years. And the reasons for that is because animals are still cheap. Anybody can have a computer and almost anybody that can afford it can have a vehicle. And that's all you need to start a mobile live animal program. There's no regulation. You can get animals, 
keep them in your basement, set up a WordPress website in about three hours and start calling yourself an animal therapist, an animal educator, and go out and go to daycares and shopping malls and corporate events and county fairs. Anywhere where someone will write a check for you to bring your animals, you can do that. And it's a huge problem across the country, but it's the worst in Ontario. We now have tracked 76 businesses doing this in Southern Ontario alone. And a lot of people don't realize the extent of them and they're actually growing and they're completely unregulated. They're posing severe animal welfare concerns, real public health and safety concerns and other concerns as well for the municipalities that are trying to uh, regulate them. We also, of course, have pets. We have mass market trade, meaning retail pet stores, so all the sort of common exotics that you see, some of the bird species. There's about 20 or 25 uh, reptile species that are the most common and then likewise uh, fish, uh, invertebrates and amphibians. Uh, and of course we have uh, the specialty trade, the online trade, that's where today you're going to get the capybaras, you're going to get some of the more exotic reptiles, you're going to get exotic amphibians. You know, if you want to buy a capybara, you look online uh, for that specialty trade. And that still exists, it's very extensive, although the types of animals have shifted somewhat. And of course you see all kinds of exotic animals in research laboratories. Um, if you look at, uh, and this relates to zoos uh, and other kinds of public animal displays in Ontario, it sort of gives you an idea of the distribution of them with regard to where they are in Canada. And this holds true pretty much as far as we can tell for exotic pets as well, where you get the bulk of the problem is in Ontario because we're largely unregulated. Uh, then Quebec, which has about 10 million people, so you would expect it to probably have a big problem. And there are also uh, lacks on regulation. And then as you go to other provinces, you see that it's smaller and smaller uh, numbers. And like I said, this applies to zoos. It also seems to apply to exotic pets. So the biggest problems are in the biggest provinces with the biggest populations. Now, there's, there's some good things that have occurred over the years. It's, you know, uh, it's often when you read the newspapers and, and look at information that's provided, it seems pretty bleak, and it is for individual animals. But uh, there are some good things that are happening. Certainly public interest and concern about some exotics uh, has exploded. You know, it's grown exponentially over the last 20 years. So it's, you're really hard pressed to find people that think, you know, your neighbor should have a, a troop of baboons or a tiger. Most people don't agree with that anymore and that's manifested as well in the political arena. So that's a very good development. Uh, laws and policy makers right across the board, we deal from coast to coast and 20, 25 years ago, you walk in, this was a fringe issue. It's not treated that way anyway, uh, anywhere today. It, that doesn't mean that you know, we're seeing what we need to see in terms of laws and regulation, but certainly when you go in and have the discussions, uh, we don't find anywhere. It doesn't matter if we're in the most rural Newfoundland municipality or Northern Manitoba or anywhere, these issues are treated with some level of respect. Uh, public acceptance of the keeping of a lot of exotics, particularly those you know, big charismatic ones I've mentioned numerous times and particularly the dangerous ones has gone way down. That's very good. Uh, but of course, acceptance of things like reptiles in people's homes, it's been normalized and a lot of people just don't give that a second thought. Uh, the numbers of zoos have gone way down. East of Ontario and west of Ontario, there are no old style slum zoos left in Canada. That's not to say there's not bad zoos, uh, there are. But uh, these sort of quintessential old style roadside zoos are gone and what's left in Ontario is a remnant of what used to be there. So that's a good development. Uh, zoos with uh, wild animal acts and novelty acts like wrestling bears and boxing kangaroos, they're way down. They've pretty much vanished. And in fact, we no longer have any animal-based uh, circuses here in Canada. The few that do come in with hardly any animals these days uh, are coming from the US. So that's, that was something that many of you probably dealt with in the past. You had people protesting and complaining about circuses. Well, that's an issue that's uh, dying, uh, was dying a slow death, but that death is being expedited and I think soon it will be gone altogether. Um, the larger zoo type species kept as pets, I mentioned already, that's a great trend that it's down. Laws and regulations, while we're still really lax everywhere, um, the numbers of them have gone up, particularly on a municipal level, so that's very good. And here in Ontario, a lot of municipalities have acted because the province has been so slow in addressing this, and the few things that they have done haven't 
uh, actually a really mitigated any of the concerns. Uh, there's great air restrictions on the keeping of native wildlife. That's pretty much ubiquitous across the country. Um, and it's usually fish and wildlife agencies and governments that are pushing that. Uh, it'd be nice if they pushed it for exotics as well, but so far most haven't. And then we're just starting to see increased use of positive list regulation. For any of you who don't know what a positive list is, it's simply a list of animals that you can keep instead of an animals that you can't keep. And we'll get into uh, why positive list regulation is the way to go in future uh, shortly. There's some bad things. I mentioned mobile live animal programs. Uh, they're setting up uh, and there's already over 70 in Ontario and they're elsewhere across the country. Uh, there's other kinds of exotic animal and reptile shows that are taken out, some that are uh, done on uh, a free basis by amateurs that aren't looking at this as a source of revenue. Uh, there's a number of reptile zoos that want to open up, uh, particularly in Ontario. They basically want to franchise their operations and they use those operations as a base for doing these mobile live animal programs out, out in the communities that surround the, their base operation. So that's uh, something that uh, is an emerging problem. Uh, some, some small exotic pet species are rising in numbers. We've seen that with some reptile species, some uh, uh, certainly some of the mammal species like the capybaras and wallabies, they've become far more popular uh, recently, so that's a problem. The municipal law focus, and in many cases provincial laws as well, um, they tend to focus on the mammals to the exclusion of uh, most birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, and invertebrates. That's a huge problem. We now know that all of these other animals have the same cognitive, emotional, and social capabilities uh, uh, as the so-called higher animals, the mammals, we know that, you know, uh, a lot more about their biology behavior, their lifestyles. The science tells us that, hey, we should be giving these animals the same consideration that we give the mammals, but when you look at the laws and regulations, that's not the case. And in fact, most bylaws across the country that use prohibited lists uh, hardly include any birds, uh, any reptiles, amphibians, fish, or invertebrates. It's almost all centered on mammals, and that's primarily because the old lists were based almost exclusively on public safety concerns. Um, there's no meaningful emphasis on human health issues, which you'll hear about later. And then here in Ontario, there's, there's a little bit of organized opposition to these bylaws. It's not like it used to be. Uh, in the past, when you walked in to talk about uh, a bylaw or um, provincial law at a committee meeting or at a council meeting, you know, it would be three of us and 200 of them. All the pet owners would come out of the woodwork and they'd boo and hiss every time you finished each sentence. Uh, you know, that opposition doesn't exist like that anymore, but it is still there. Uh, the reality is that, you know, we've got huge numbers of exotics out there. They potentially can come from uh, a very large pool of species. And just to give you an idea of the scale of the problem, if you look at the fact that most reptiles accept giant snakes and venomous reptiles are completely unregulated. It doesn't really make any sense, particularly if you're thinking about other things like nuisance issues for municipalities, animal welfare, human health and safety. So you look at reptiles, there's t over 10,700 reptile species, yet very few have been addressed in our laws. And, you know, we'll get into why uh, negative lists aren't uh, the way to go when you're dealing with numbers of species. But certainly, it's impossible when you look at these individually or even in small groups according to genus or family. Uh, it's, it's really challenging for any municipality or any provincial government to have the expertise and the wherewithal to actually regulate these animals in a meaningful way. Uh, traditionally, these issues have been dealt in a whack-a-mole fashion and uh, what I mean by that is that for many, many years, while we've been fighting to get overriding legislation in various provinces and have been successful, what, what we've also done at the same time simultaneously is try to fight, you know, there's new zoo opening or getting rid of the, the, the really bad zoo or getting rid of the, uh, you know, the exotic pet collector that's got 300 venomous snakes in a municipality, uh, all of these situations. So you fight them and, you know, you get rid of three, but then three more pop up because we need that uh, legislation that controls them all. So from an advocacy side of things, many of us are playing sort of a game of whack-a-mole. You knock one down, another pops up. And we thought we had gotten the zoo and sort of wild animal problem under control in Ontario, even in the absence of legislation. And yet it's whack-a-mole again because these mobile live animal programs popped up. 
and you know there, it's like you have a you put grass seed down there and they're coming up all over the place. Uh, there's a number of key issues. I'm for the sake of time not going to get into them. I've mentioned a few already, and you'll hear more about them during the day. A number of of key challenges, and uh, you know I think all of them are, are important. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit more today on uh, the smaller exotics, but much of what we're going to discuss, uh, you know, particularly with regard to the problems that these uh, are generated by the presence of these animals in society apply to other animals in other situations. Uh, I just wanted to show a couple of slides uh, of some of the mobile live animal programs. Some of them run by accredited zoos that are accredited by the National Zoo Association. And this just shows uh, kids that uh, are very young having unmitigated contact with reptiles that if you look at most of the public health agencies advise, uh, advisories and other types of information, including uh, legions of peer-reviewed papers going back to the 1940s, um, this is something that should never, never occur, and yet, yet it does all over Ontario and all over Canada. And then a big sort of bugaboo of mine is uh, reptile shows where basically everything about the biology, behavior, and lifestyle of these animals, every husbandry need that you could possibly think of is largely ignored for the sake of, of convenience. And uh, you know, these animals end up being treated by commodity, uh, as commodities, just something for sale. Uh, they're collectibles. And uh, you know, this is uh, an issue that I think is also uh, a huge problem. And you can see here just these animals, uh, you know, they're not looking at, hey, where did they come from? How do they live? What, what are their humidity needs and lighting and temperature? And, you know, all, all those things that you really have to consider when you're looking at uh, appropriate husbandry, it, not, none of it even factors in. So these are, these are the kinds of things we have to change. Uh, there's a lot of sort of low-hanging fruit issues for us that are working on uh, changing laws uh, or even enforcing laws. We could do a lot more with uh, some of the simpler ones to deal with, like African clawed frogs, Siamese fighting fish, uh, you know, large birds and reptiles. There's a whole host of issues that if you look at them probably could be addressed that currently uh, are not. So I think there's a lot out there that we could work on very quickly while we're working on changing the whole uh, system itself. And for me, I'm a bit of more of a field herper. I used to keep exotic reptiles and other creatures when I was a kid. And when I was 14, realized, hey, that, you know, I get a lot out of this, but they don't really get anything. And no matter how hard I try, I can't really do enough for them. So I gave it up. And these days, uh, I like to go see animals in the wild, like the sagebrush lizard in Death Valley. And this was uh, not the actual picture, but a changeable lizard I wa watched in Kuala Lumpur, in the Kuala Lumpur bird park. And I like to go out and see them, how they really should be living. And I think that when we're thinking about all of these animals, this is what we should be thinking about, how they evolved to live, how they adapted to live in certain environments. And if we do that, that'll help change our perspective on this whole thing. Now, this really doesn't have anything to do with animal welfare, but I see Carl Bando up there in the back. And uh, <laughs> I thought, I, I just have to put this photo in because Darwin the monkey, the Ikea monkey, which by the way is now an official species, uh, <laughs> and they all wear shirling coats, even in the wild. Um, it's just a cute picture, but I think, you know, Darwin brought a lot of these issues uh, into the public consciousness. Uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, when they see something in the newspaper, they would think about it a little bit, like a snake found or, you know, things like that. But Darwin had legs. That issue went on for a long, long time. And even today, you talk to a lot of people, even in BC and Alberta and Newfoundland, they all know about, about this monkey. So Darwin was sort of a, a wonderful uh, segue for many people into thinking about exotic animal issues. And of course, one of them that is a primary concern to many of us is animal welfare. Now, when you look at uh, the uh, institutional or commercial use of animals, uh, and to a certain extent, other kinds of uses, one thing that struck me over the years of, of looking at all kinds of situations is that we had a totem pole of priorities that I think is totally backwards. Uh, and right now, when you look at so many institutional and commercial uses of animals, that totem pole of priority, and this one is for exotic pets, is vendor first. You see that manifested in the reptile shows where, hey, let's put them in Tupperware containers and that type of thing. So the vendor first for profit and convenience, consumer second, and then the animals come third. I think in every situation when we approach it, we have to keep in mind that we have to shift that paradigm on its head. We have to always put animals first, consumer second, 
and vendors third. And if we do that, it doesn't mean that we might not have zoos or we might not have exotic pets, but what it will do is change the whole paradigm for these animals and make it into something more productive now, or, or more productive than it is currently. Uh, with regard to animal welfare, um, there's been a lot of different uh, definitions of animal welfare. It's evolving. One of the earlier ones was from Donald Broom. Very simple, the welfare of an individual is their state as they attempt to cope with their environment. Well, since Donald Broom's time, a lot of different people have weighed in, developed animal welfare definitions, and they incorporate different kinds of ideas. Primary amongst them is that animals, uh, in order to have good welfare, have to feel good. They have to have positive states of feeling. And if you don't have those, then the animal may not be sick or injured or dying, but it still doesn't necessarily have good welfare. And you see that manifested in all kinds of definitions. This, like this quote from the uh, very simple one from Jake Vesey, who was an animal welfare scientist at the Calgary Zoo, just said that uh, good welfare is when an animal feels happy or content. So as you look at the development of uh, thought on animal welfare, you see that no longer is it just basic biology and basic functioning. It's these other things too that are coming into play. And then other people started talking as well while all this was going on about the fact that animals have evolved to live in particular environments and do particular things. So in order for them to have good welfare, they have to have an ability to live a natural life. And uh, that's become now one of the uh, foundation principles of animal welfare. And it's not really a, a new idea. It started with uh, Heine Hedegger and, and uh, just the post-World War II period. He was sort of the founder of modern zoo biology, but others have uh, uh, added to his thoughts from back, back in that time. But very much now, when you're looking at exotic animals, a factor to consider is, are animals able to live a natural life uh, according to their adaptations. I like the way that David Frazier and others now talk about animal welfare, and I would suggest that this is a very good way of looking at animal welfare. There are three overlapping and interrela uh, interrelated components of welfare. There's obviously the basic health and functioning, uh, but there's the affective states. That's how animals feel, well, you know, the emotional state of animals, how, how they're feeling on a day-to-day on -day basis. And then natural living, the ability to live uh, life in a way that suits the animal's natural adaptations. And I think if you don't have each of these components dealt with, you don't have good welfare. And I think most people, and certainly you see this manifested in the literature, uh, would agree with that. So if you only remember uh, one thing that I'm saying today, uh, just, just remember that definition. We need those three interrelated components to have good welfare. Now, when you look at the reptile shows, when you look at many zoos, when you look at other situations, you see that they're focused mainly on number one. Zoos today are sort of moving into number two, dealing with effective states and a little bit in number three, but a lot of the institutional and commercial uses of animals st still today uh, focus on number one, and we have to make sure that that doesn't remain the case. So I'm just going to finish with one other thought. Uh, you can read the rest of what's on the screen, but it's this one here, that for a lot of the animals that are now part of the discussion, in the past, people thought that they didn't really have lives. They didn't think, they didn't make decisions, they didn't have social lives, they, that they were different, that somehow they were like biological robots, and that was a, uh, uh, a term that I got off of one of our later speakers, Clifford Warwick. I thought it was wonderful, you know. Uh, and, and I think you see in the exotic pet trade this idea that many of these animals are biological robots manifested in, in husbandry practices and, and the way that they present and talk about these animals. Uh, they're not biological robots. They're animals, and they have lives. They have interests, desires, needs, wants. They have husbandry needs. They have, when you watch them in the wild, they have lifestyles. They have things that they do. They're not biological robots, and we have to make sure that uh, in, in our work every day that we make sure that, that that is understood. And finally, I think in, in everything we do, we should think about the precautionary principle. We have to give the animals the benefit of the doubt. If we don't, then I don't think we're uh, giving them the consideration they deserve. If we don't know enough about them to properly care for and keep them, then we should question whether we should keep them at all.